Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm here with Alison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature, works with the Penn Translation Committee, and has been a driving force organizing Translating the Future, the conference that you are now attending. This year's celebration of Juneteenth seemed to resonate further and wider than ever before. Black Artists for Freedom, a collective of Black workers in the culture industries, published a statement in which they call on cultural institutions to break ties with the police, put their money where their mouths are, advocate for Black people, get educated, and to imagine Black freedom. On their website, some of the signatories also proclaim what form these imaginings will take. Mitchell S. Jackson, recent Coleman Center Fellow and author of Survival Math, writes, Black freedom is the space to imagine. It's a space to make mistakes and not have them define the rest of you. It's a sense of solidarity with the diaspora. It's a sense of belonging. It's a place of empowerment. Freedom is rarely given, it must be seized. Thank you, Allison. And thank all of you for joining us for the seventh installment of our weekly program, uh, Motherless Tongues, Multiple Belongings. In this first conversation, part of a mini series that will explore and explode the notion of the mother tongue, we'll hear from Monica de la Torre, Jeffrey Angles, and Bruna Dantas Lovato. Monica works with and between languages. Jeffrey is a poet, translator, and professor whose poetry written in Japanese won the Yomiuri Prize for Literature in Japan. And Bruna is a Brazilian writer and translator whose panel, we're very grateful to her for this, at the 2019 Alta Conference served as inspiration for this mini series. This series of weekly one hour conversations is the form that Translating the Future will continue to take throughout the summer and into the fall. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with conversations about the past, present, and future of literary translation and its place in the world where we find ourselves. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for Queer Literature, Queer Legacies, Looking Forward Toward the Future of LGBTQ Translation, a conversation between Achi Ovejas and Sean Bai, moderated by Elizabeth Rose. And check the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art, and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachman and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Monica de la Torre, Jeffrey Angles, and Bruna Dantas Lovato to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep your questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. And if you know anyone who is unable to join us for the live stream, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Monica, Jeffrey, and Bruna, we'd like to offer our sincere gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the CUNY Graduate Center the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and PEN America, and also to the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound, who are making this live stream possible. And now, over to you guys. Thank you, Esther and Allison, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone for tuning in today. This topic is very dear to my heart, um, especially as someone who's come to English and eventually to translation as an immigrant. And there's often this assumption that one can only have one true language, which is the mother tongue, and it's tied to a nation state, right? And it's where your citizenship might come from. But of course, that's often not true, especially as you know, with global forces, colonialism. I mean, there's so much at play. <laughs> um, our bodies are 
there's they're constantly in movement and our relationships are ever changing so I would love to begin by hearing a little bit about your relationships to your languages and how you've arrived at the languages you have in that translation. So, uh, Monica, if you could please begin. Thank you for your question, Bruna, and thank you, Alison, Esther, and everyone for being here. Um, well, um, it's interesting because uh, I didn't tell my mother this was happening today, because if I did, she'd be like, what do you mean motherless tongue? Because my mother actually is from, is from whom I learned English. So my mother tongue is officially English, although I did not grow up using my mother tongue because my mother emigrated to Mexico um, to study Spanish actually, fell in love with my father, had me and my family and got progressively more comfortable with Spanish as we were growing up. So even though maybe when I was born, she did speak English with me because she had just been there for a few years and wasn't that comfortable with it. Um, uh, she, we, we gradually kind of boycotted English at home in Mexico City because we really did not like being seen in, in public speaking English uh, with my mom and just spoke back in Spanish to her. So. Technically, that is my mother, my mother tongue. Um, I was schooled in a bilingual school in Mexico City where you know, a lot of literature classes happened in English. Um, it was a very good school in, in, in terms of its bilinguality. And I would visit my mother's family often and um, had a kind of uncomfortable relationship with English. But if I stayed here long enough, I would progressively feel a little more comfortable with it. But I never imagined I'd be writing in English. It only happened, it was an accident of you know, um, life that I ended up coming to get an MFA, uh, not knowing it wasn't my plan, I was gonna do something else, but the opportunity arose and I came here and I thought, well, what do I do? Do I transit myself every week for workshop or um, do I just give it a try and see what happens? And I started working in English and um, hence reclaiming my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey. Yeah. Wow, that, that, that's fascinating to hear. Um, yeah, but first of all, before I answer the question, I want to uh, echo Monica's uh, thanks to everybody here, to Esther, to, to Allison, to, to Penn, to Cooney, to the New York Public Library, HowlRound, and everybody else. It's a real honor to be included in this series. Um, so yeah, my, my, my uh, interaction with Japanese um, started when I was uh, uh, 15 years old. Um, I went to Japan as a high school exchange student. Um, I was, a, I was a, a, a boy that had really never been outside of the American Midwest. I think I had seen the ocean twice. <laughs> I had only seen mountains once or twice in my life. And, and then suddenly I, I went to Southern Japan um, in, a, in a town that was at the very, very, very end of the big island of Honshu. So it was surrounded on three sides by water, um, mountains rising right out of the sea in these wonderful dramatic fashions. And, um, and so uh, like, I, I felt like I was really seeing the world for the first time. It was this huge jolt outside of my, uh, my ordinary kind of mode of existence that, that made me determine, okay, I'm gonna learn this language and this is going to be um, you know, my second language of expression. Um, and you know, for, for a long time, I was um, one of these you know, kind of nerdy, uh, quiet kids that like to sit, uh, sit alone and read poetry and that sort of thing. Um, uh, as I began to work on Japanese and, and, uh, and uh, eventually went to gr graduate school in Japanese, um, you know, I had been writing poetry of my own up until that point in English. Um, but once I encountered graduate school, I stopped because I, I discovered there was, I had naively assumed that, uh, that many of the, the great works, that many of the great writers were being translated into English. And however, as soon as I began to kind of really dive deeply into Japanese literature, I realized that if this is the field of Japanese literature, this tiny corner is how much we have in translation. You know, the, um, just the overwhelming majority of the writing that's happening is not being translated. Um, in fact, um, uh, recently for an article that I was writing, I did, um, I did a, uh, a look through, um, through uh, three percent uh, database to see you know how many things are being translated and I found out that there were five books of translation of poetry from Japanese translated in the best year that they have on record so you know I mean that five books in a year that's that's hardly anything 
um, when you consider that there are 14,000 books being published every month in Japan, 14,000. So, so um, it just, I just I was so overwhelmed by how much literature there was that I began to turn to translations to, to pour all of my love for writing, all of my, um, my desire for that into translation. Um, I did that for a number of years. Um, and um, it was really um, in 2009 to 2011 when I was when I was living and working in Japan full time, that um, that really I felt that, that um, you know, and I was thinking in Japanese all the time. Um, everything was in Japanese. That it really made sense to kind of sit down and start writing in Japanese again, uh, or start writing in Japanese for the first time. I'd done academic articles and so on in, in Japanese all along, all along the way, but I hadn't actually done that kind of creative writing. But you know, one of the wonderful things about doing translation is that it's a really kind of intense form of reading, right? I mean, it's about the closest form of reading that you can possibly have. And so, um, and so it was in the course of like reading Japanese poets over the course of years that, um, that you know, I really felt like I was studying very intensely what people were doing with language, the silences that, that were in the language, the, you know, the, the particular modes of expression, the choices of language and so on. Um, and so you know, that very special form of reading, I think kind of naturally sort of lends itself to writing if you're kind of of a writerly personality. Um, I, uh, I uh, pulled something off my wall that I wanted to show you. I, maybe you can see in the back there, there's a, a bunch of things hanging on the wall. There's a little space up there that's now blank. Um, and uh, I pulled this off. This is, a, this is something that with the, the writer uh, Takahashi Mutsuo um, had written um, some years ago when he was giving a lecture at the Kennedy Center and I was translating for him. He just wrote this as a little diagram, but he wrote the word yomu, um, which uh, in Japanese means to read. And then he also wrote the classical Japanese word for to, to compose poetry, which is also yomu. And his point was that, was that you know, these two words, even though they're you know, different words, they share an etymology um, in, in the classical Japanese language. Um, you know, reading is a form of kind of composition, uh, you know, within our minds, within our own experiences. And uh, translation, I think, you know, is like one of the most beautiful places where we can see that. But, you know, it was really from that sort of equation of, of reading um, and composing that, that led me one step further to, to actually writing in Japanese. Wow. I love that you call uh, Japanese your second language of expression. I think I might adopt that, you know, and thinking, I definitely think about my languages that way too, especially as it's blurry, which one is dominant, my dominant language at this point, they're both pretty close. Um, but do you think that your relationship to these languages, maybe the proximity you have to them at this point and the sincere loyalty affects how you select the, the texts you translate or what kinds of decisions you make on the page? That's a really, I, I really <clears throat> like the fact that you use the word loyalty. It's, it's something that we could spend a, lo a lot of time talking about, like one's loyalty to a language, right? Because maybe I'm not gonna, I will answer your question, but before I answer it, I just wanna say that. What it makes me think about is this sense of a possible betrayal when you choose not to write in the language you were expected to write in, right? So in my case, I would have been expected to write in Spanish, and I did, and I still do, but not to the degree of commitment that I that I that I um, bring to English. And so I think I think that kind of tension is really productive, uh, and it can't be easily forgotten, right? Like sometimes we, yeah, like what what choices are we making, say, when we choose to adopt the conventions, like Jeffrey was talking about academic writing in, in Japanese, right? That is producing a body of knowledge that will be uh, available to a readership and not to another readership. So what kinds of imbalances might that produce or what kind of, yeah, what, what, are, the, what are the questions that accessibility and the lack of uh, accessibility bring up are really interesting to me. And it's something that I wrestle with. Um, now, your question about what to translate, I think in terms of loyalties, I think is really pertinent as well because it, what it conjures for me is an opportunity, the opportunity that translation gives one to 
establish a lineage between one's creative practice and the body of work that you choose to read so closely and be so intimate with when you translate. So one of the things that I uh, was trying to do when I began translating a very long time ago, also out of the sense of like, what? How can it be that American <clears throat> poets that I'm encountering at MF and in my MFA program and everything have basically three frames of reference for poetry written in Spanish. It's either Octavio Paz, Federico García Lorca, Neruda, and some, like the really sophisticated people who read outside of that had also read Vallejo. And that was it. And so it was like, I need to do something about it. So I, perhaps it was a bit hubristic, you know, to try to uh, go like, I'm going to rectify this and I'm going to translate all these women poets, contemporary women poets who were not being translated. And then I undertook another project that was actually really hubristic. And it was this neo-baroque uh, Mexican Spanish refugee poet Gerardo Denise, who at the time was incredibly difficult to translate because all the work is super hyper referential. Like one poem might have 55 allusions that back in the pre-internet days would take you a really long time to figure out in order to translate. But that's that's what I did. That's what I did. And I wanted to bring some of the richness of other um, forms of expression that were resistant to translation precisely because of their complexity. It was that particular type of neo-baroque poetry that I thought needed to bring, be brought into English because precisely the fact that it was so complex was the thing that was making it not appealing to translators. It doesn't translate well, and that was the issue for me. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I think about loyalty a ton because one, I'm like a complete traitor in more than one direction. Another one <laughs> is because my relationship to the Portuguese language in my case is never going to be national, right? Like I'm not tied to the entirety of the country, especially when the country is so large and there are so many uh, forms of existence that have nothing to do with me. So in many ways, my ties to Portuguese are pretty regional. So I have like a little corner of the country that I'm interested in. And I don't know what kind of translator I would be if, you know, I had a completely different path. I think my curation process is now completely personal. For some people, maybe even contaminated, which I love. Like, I love a good unsanitized um, approach to this because now it's, it's personal. It's full of biases and interests and agendas. Um, Jeffrey, I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. Um. I love the fact that um, almost as soon as we begin to talk about loyalty, we begin to talk about betrayal. That's something that's really lovely. Um, uh, you know, we, I think we spend so much time uh, as when, when, when we're kind of in translation mode, thinking about fidelity, thinking about those kind of, you know, um, sort of old tired notions that we've thought through, you know, a million times backward and forward um, in a, a lot of different ways. And of course, like the desire to betray becomes stronger and stronger. Um, you know, I, I think that there is there is something to to Monica's um, uh, statement. You know that by 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 you know kind of going out there and choosing particular texts, we are sort of betraying expectations. You know, I, I really am. I'm one, I think one of the reasons that I that I'm interested in writing in Japanese, and it's been so much fun, is that um, is that um, it has betrayed expectations. Um, uh, you know, uh, when I was sitting down to to write this book, um, the the, the, the one that was mentioned in the introduction, Watashi no Hizuke Henko-san. Um, I, um, you know, I specifically tried to think about, you know, what Japanese poets were doing and try to figure out a kind of twist on that, you know, to try to figure out some sort of way to do what was happening differently. So, you know, in a way I'm, I'm sort of betraying expectations that I would write in English, but I'm also trying to betray some of the expectations that exist in the Japanese language, you know, to, in order to open up a new space. Um, you know, when I, when I s sat down, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated with people that sort of betray their own language and, and the wonderful things that happen. Um, you know, if we look back over, um, you know, English uh, literary history, we see, you know, all kinds of people, you know, great, great, great writers, um, you know, who, who, for whom English wasn't the first language, you know, Joseph Conrad, you know, like what an interesting, quirky stylist he is. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, people like writers from India who have uh, two, three, four languages under their belt and, and they bring those things into their writing, you know, like Anita Desai or Salman Rushdie, you know, um, all, you know, bilingual writers. Um, 
um, you know, nowadays we've got um, Ilya Kaminsky, Don Miche, you know, who are working in English and, and, and bringing in, I think, some of the resonances and sounds of their particular language. Um, Yoko Tawada, like uh, who writes uh, both in Japanese and German, is like my hero, <laughs> and uh, and I love the fact that she's you know a she's able to do such quirky things in both of the languages in which she's working. So um, you know, so uh, so betrayal is actually kind of you know uh, is is the point of departure for uh, for creativity. Um, but there's also, yeah, at the same time that we're like, we're constantly betraying things. I think, you know, there's also certain kinds of loyalties that are formed in translation. I totally agree with you, Bruna. Like you're, you're very, I don't feel connected to every writer in Japan by any means. Um, um, there are certain writers that I love, certain writers with whom I feel connected and I, and I want to bring those over into English. Um, but, you know, it, I, I like the fact that like, you know, there, there are, there is in translation certain kinds of loyalties that um, exist you know, across space, across time, you know, we can fall in love with writers that are dead. Um, we can live in their skin. We can adopt their voice. We can, uh, we can, uh, we can be shamans to transfer their, for, uh, their voices into, into a new, into a new world, into a new form. And so, uh, so I love these kind of, uh, th these kind of dual um, and often sort of conflicting betrayals and loyalties that are constantly at play. I mean, yeah, most, households in the world are multilingual and it is interesting to think about that there aren't enough people from multilingual households coming to translation you know that there is still i think a lot of pressure one uh to be uh to have a relationship with language that's one directional right you have one language and then you learn another versus um I mean, I didn't necessarily, I didn't choose to betray my mother tongue, for example. It was a global landscape that pushed me in a certain direction. So, and I think that's fairly common. So I don't quite know if it is, you know, that there's all this phenomenon of people writing in second languages versus it is the natural state for people to write in second languages. And this idea that you only work with one language is actually artificial. I could be lecturing for a bit. <laughs> no, but very well put, thank you. <laughs> yeah, because um, I'm thinking about how monocultural populations and monolingual populations were engineered, right? They don't naturally exist. Mm -hmm. So they're socially engineered, for example, in like post-Holocaust Germany or 18th century France. This desire to have a population be homogeneous is just, bogus. And I come from a multilingual family, though I don't speak their languages. So there's that pressure too. Um, there's the constant loss. So yeah, so I don't know, maybe the natural state is already this cross pollination, this constant, I like the word contamination, because I, I, I guess it goes against the purism that sometimes I find in academia for translation being like this pristine thing. Um, yeah, and also I think a lot about how um, it is so common too for people's language of instruction uh, not to be the same as the language they speak at home, either because of colonialism or because like Latin or France, say uh, French in Russia or something. Those things are fairly common. And yet I find that in the United States, at least where I live, people are kind of shocked that I work with a second language as if they've never heard of like this entire past. Um, how has it been like for you, you know, as you're navigating these many currents, how has it been to um, make the choices you make both on the page, but also about the text you select and then fight for what you're doing? Do you feel that you have to defend your allegiances or that it's natural? Do people accept it fully or not? Is this some kind of um, push and pull that you have to engage in? I'm just curious about um, yeah, I guess if how well received it is. Uh, okay, we'll follow the order we've established. Um, I was just thinking of one of the things you said before you posed a question, which is this notion of, yeah, uh, imperialism, colonialism. Doesn't it seem disingenuous, uh, especially in terms of American imperialism, right? Pushing English everywhere, right? consume pop music, consume films, consume media, but don't speak our language. Don't speak it too well, because if you do, it's like, oh, 
you know English so well. How did you, how did you manage to, well, I, I, I still happen to have grown up in Mexico where it is impossible not to hear English on a daily basis everywhere, right? It's on, it's on cable TV, it's on the radio, everywhere. Um, so that, that just seems a bit uh, disingenuous. And, and I also think of something that David Bellows writes about in uh, Is That a Fish in Your Ear? And this notion that American or English speaking, not necessarily American, English speaking monolinguals are a tiny minority compared to people who speak English globally. So amongst all of us who speak English, yes, the majority of us are bilingual, if not more, and the tiny bit of monolinguals, they are the ones resisting our use of English as a language uh, for art and expression, etc. So that's particularly interesting. One thing um, that informed um, the book that I uh, use a lot of translation, self-translation um, on repetition 19. Um, one of the things that informed it is varying approaches to translation. I have, when I started off, it was in the nineties and um, people would really frown upon my translating into English. They're like, no, 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 you can't translate into English. You translate into Spanish. I mean, you can't, what? Regardless of the mother tongue complication, the assumption was that it wasn't my mother tongue. And even if it was, I grew up in Mexico, I was schooled in, in Spanish and therefore I should not translate into English. So um, that I feel is changing dramatically. But another thing that I heard, and I would be very curious to hear if you've ever had any pushback in this regard, was that when I showed my translations to some people early on, they would say, well, you know, there's, there's too many Latinists in this. It doesn't, it doesn't, you really want to produce a translation that should try to pass as the original. So whenever there's something that points, that indicates to the reader that this might be a translation, get rid of it, avoid it, use words, use, use Germanic words, use Anglo-Saxon words, you know, avoid Latinx. And I was like, okay, I sort of believed it at the time because I was just like learning. I was learning translation, I was learning to write, I was learning so many things. And, uh, and that turns out to be completely ideological, right? There's, where did that come from? I mean, there was a time in which Anglo-Saxon like translations of the Bible were seen as vulgar and Latinates were considered much more elegant and sophisticated. So um, yeah, that's my take on your question. Wow, I love that. Uh, would you read a few poems for us? Well, I it's can... relevant to the whole conversation. Okay, so actually, um, yeah. So one of the sections of the book has 25 different translations of the same poem that I wrote in Spanish when I had just moved to the US. And the poem is called Equivalencias. So maybe I'll read the Spanish and then I'll read you one translation and then we'll go to Jeffrey and then maybe we can circle around. So, um, equivalencias. Uno, un silencio, una llamarada, un sorbo de café antes de que supiera amargo, un hoyo dentro de un agujero, dos caminos para una trayectoria y sus ojos cerrados durmiendo la siesta. ¿Cuántos espejos son dos? Cae la tarde y aparecen dos luces. Dos hijos que ya son tres. Tres es paz y garantía. Un cómplice, un enemigo. Tres libros abiertos, tres granos de sal. Cuatro veces dije un nombre y nada. Cuatro es lo mismo que dos. Y si cinco veces te preguntas, ¿qué hago aquí? Quema tu cama, déjala arder y vete. So for one of the translations, this was my political translation. I mean, a lot of them are political, but this one was in response to what was going on the summer I was embarking on this project. It was 2018. And that was when Trump implemented his zero tolerance policy that ended up uh, producing children in cages, right? That's when it all began because, because of the status of the minors um, who ended up being separated from their families. And I was in Montalvo at a residency that, as it turns out, was founded by some, was, it had been the estate of a man whose senatorial re-election campaign in San Francisco, the motto for it was, keep California white. So that says everything. I mean, he was involved with the Chinese Exclusion Act, 
and, and Japanese, et cetera. So I was like, I felt very compelled to respond. And my response to that was to uh, frame a, a translation as uh, a one that would be obedient and only include Anglo-Saxon words with Anglo-Saxon roots. So all the Latinates in this translation are eliminated. A big, beautiful wall is the name of the translation. One, no din, a flash. A sip of a hot drink made from roasted and ground seeds found bitter after swallowing. A bottomless pit. Twofold roads, one path, and shut eyes unawake. Two looking glasses are how many? With dusk come lights. Two children now three. Three is oath, is stillness, a chum, a foe. Three truths, three, three lies. Four times the speaker said nothing. Four and two are the same. Having asked five times why she'd stayed there, she set the bed on fire and left, letting it burn. So the words that are eliminated are coffee, silence, peace, fire. Yeah. Wow, oh, very telling. I love that. Okay. Jeffrey. Uh, great. Wow, thank you. It's lovely to hear that. Um, I've been reading. I've been reading your book, Monica, on the page. It's really nice to have a voice associated with it. Um, why don't I read a poem that's called "Honyaku um, Nitsuite" um, on translation, since it's so obviously about these kind of um, gaps between languages. Um, um, it, it, you know, I wrote it in Japanese, but then later on, I did an English translation because so many people asked me what was in this book. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll combine the two for reasons I hope are obvious. Going into the bedroom, I find another me already there. That me is not blonde, that me has black hair. He asks me why I'm here. He simply tells me to get in, that he has been waiting for me since the moment we were born. We use different languages, but somehow we communicate. I take off my clothes, lie down, tell him about my childhood. About dropping the ice cream and crying, about being scolded after losing my shoes in the snow, about the pillow fights with father, I remember. Says that other me. But when he reads, uh, speaks of his memories, they sound like the memories of someone else. The bed I remember becomes a futon. The lakes I remember become seas. Sandals become zori. Lunch boxes wa obento ni naru. Lunch boxes become bento. Futari no watashi no hanashi o tsure chigai, au koto wa nakanaka nai. Our conversations slip by one another, never quite meeting in between. Futari no watashi wa tame iki o morashi, hei wa chinmoku ni modotte shimao. The two of me let out a silence and the room returns to silence. Sheets no shita de odo odo shite o tegai no teo tori u shibaraku tenjo o augu. Fidgeting beneath the sheets, I take the hand of that other me and stare at the ceiling for some time. Yagatte, dakiai, eventually we embrace. Akano tani no yoni aibushiao, ikko no kanzen jinkaku ni nareru yoni. Eventually we embrace, caressing like two strangers in the hopes of turning into one person complete. Wow. Jeffrey, and have you experienced any pushback in your, you know, many experiences everywhere um it's that's a, that's an interesting question um so when i when i um first of all i should say that when i was when i was writing the poems that went into this book i was i was serializing them in a small japanese journal um i had very nice responses from people who were reading the journal sometimes people would contact me on twitter or whatever um but i didn't really think much about like sort of the political ramifications you know the, the like the um, the uh, sort of ramifications of me coming in from sort of English and a, a sort of imperial language in, in, and making the choice to write into Japanese. Um, how, however, when this book 
published it was published um, and much to my surprise it, it won a huge literary prize in Japan. I, mean, I, I couldn't believe it, you know. Um, suddenly then it did seem like the tenor of the conversation changed. <laughs> there were uh, I, I, there were quite a number of people that wrote, you know, oh, this, this award is going to uh, Jeffrey because he's a foreigner writing in Japanese and that has a kind of political significance, you know, political significance um, regarding the importance of our language and so on. And so you know, perhaps the judges wanted to give it, uh, give it to him for that reason. Um, uh, and, and so there was, there was some resistance. Um, I, uh, I, I'll never forget one person who, uh, who wrote on Twitter, uh, uh, you know, the kind of quirky oddness of this language, which I find completely unacceptable. How this, this is a Japanese poetry. And after that, it made me feel accomplished. I wanted to try to figure out a way to my own twist on, on Japanese. So, but I think overall, I, I should say that the res, this response has been uh, overwhelmingly positive so far. Good. Yeah, I mean, this idea that a text in translation shouldn't remind the reader of its foreignness is always bugging me, but I think it's pretty common. Um, in some countries have more tolerance towards foreignness than others. Mm -hmm. um, so you both, both of you have written about this multiplicity, this, the experience of being in between. Um, tell me a little bit about the process of thinking through all of that and maybe some things you've discovered through the writing. Maybe Jeffrey can start now. Cause yeah, maybe mm -hmm. Jeffrey in, in an email you said that one of the things you were you were trying to do in Japanese is really ex explore the possibilities of Japanese that and, and do things that you couldn't do in English. That would be I'm super interested in that. Like yeah, yeah. definitely. So what are those things? So um uh, uh, sorry my 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 internet a little unstable um uh. The, uh, so my apologies if I seem to be stuttering here. Uh, there, there are a number of things that you can do because Japanese has three scripts. It has uh, characters that are borrowed from, from China, kanji. It has hiragana, which is kind of like a cursive script for writing Japanese words. Takana, a script for writing foreign words. Um, uh, there, there's all sorts of possibility of, of, of bringing these three different types of scripts exactly the same thing, but you can say it in different ways. Um, also too, there's, um, there's uh, a great richness in uh, the, the history of the Japanese language. There's classical Japanese, Japanese of a hundred years ago. There's a Japanese of a thousand years ago. And so there's like all sorts of like um, Japanese's that Japanese is that can kind of be brought into, into play with one another. Something that I think probably not, you know, domestic readers wouldn't expect a foreigner to be doing. And so, you know, it was interesting to play with those things. Oh, one more thing that's very interesting. I mean, in Japanese, it's possible to write a word, um, you know, with using characters and then to put the reading beside it. Um, so like you can, in other words, you can give the meaning and you can give the pronunciation of the word separately, but simultaneously. And, um, and I really enjoyed that fact. It's something we can't do in English. Um, at least I can't think of a, a clever way to do it. Um, uh, and, and I like kind of the, the zure, the, the mismatch of sometimes, you know, when you would put a pronunciation on a word that doesn't, you know, that, that you typically wouldn't see. Um, I wrote a, a poem about, about the, uh, the rivers in Ohio where, where I grew up and about how I lived in um, a place that was ostensibly monolingual. However, I was surrounded, living, surrounded by place names in, in languages that had, had existed there far longer before the white people ever showed up. And so in, in the poem, you know, I wrote the, the meanings of those place names, you know, and then they, the pronunciation of the place names right beside each other. So that, you know, like, so when you heard the, the when you see the word Sayuro to, to refer to the river that runs through, you know, central Ohio, you could understand that, you know, what that meant in the original language. So there were, there were fun things that, that, that were possible in Japanese that, that I couldn't really think about how to do in English. 
And so um, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed ex exploring. What about you, Monica? Um, uh, your, your experimentations in this book with a multiple translations of this particular poem were incredibly fascinating to me. I just happened to read the New York Times review uh, that, 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 picked, uh, that talked about your book, I think yesterday. Oh, 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 it didn't, well, it's just mentioned, but doesn't really go into it. It doesn't go into it, but, yeah. but the fact that it sort of <laughs> mentions, you know, kind of multiplicity and sort of the spilling over of language is kind of one of the characteristics of the book. Yeah, actually really interesting. Okay, we won't go into that, but it's oh, like, okay. it's, no, 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 because it relates to, to something that Bruna was saying. I mean, I think in that review, which is not, it, it's, it, it, it reviews three books, Don Miche, um, Joelle McSweeney and Jenny Zhang, and, and it was really interesting because the writer is, uh, yeah, the critic is trying to reclaim messiness as something really cool. Mm, but I think when you're writing about people who are so expressly dealing with colonialism and Korea, I mean, to use those metaphors, I think, I think they were used in, in, in a way that was kind of problematic, but I did appreciate the shout out. Um, what can I say? So, well, one of the things I love about English that Spanish doesn't really offer is um, prepositional phrases. Below, they blow my mind. I mean, what you can do, you can completely transform a verb with the preposition that comes next to it, right? I mean, there's just like endless ways in which you can re-signify that verb with the prepositions. That's impossible in Spanish. Um, I also love concision. Um, I like how technical it can be and what happens when you bring in languages from all these different fields of knowledge and discursive practices and, and, and collage them all together in English. Something happens that I feel is a little harder to replicate in Spanish because Spanish already is kind of, I, I feel language, Spanish, even though most people think it's a very emotional language, I also find it kind of bureaucratic. It's a very bureaucratic language, very official. So when you bring things that are official sounding into literary discourse, they, they, they don't contrast as much, I think. Um, but maybe if I can swerve the question a little bit, I love your poem on translation because because it, 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 it's really open-ended and it addresses both self-translation and translation. And if we focus on self-translation only, this idea that you might develop another persona in the other language um, is, is really beautiful. And I would love to hear a little bit more about that. If, and also Bruna, like, are we, I mean, I know it's kind of like a cliche. People talk about it. It's a, you know, it's at first, oh, do you feel like a different person when you speak another language? And, but, but something does transform us, right? When we, even, even like, I remember the experience of listening to my mother speak in English with her sisters when I was growing up. And I'd be like, I felt like my mother was possessed. Like she wasn't my mother anymore. A ghost had taken over her and she became unrecognizable to me because this history that I didn't share with her was being spoken through the language. And so I just wonder what both of you think about this, this topic. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, you can go first. Um, yeah, uh, I, I specifically left that poem open-ended. Um, the, the, the idea of the two selves sort of embracing one another, holding one another, being physically in proximity to one another without that kind of contradiction ever being resolved. So, thank you for picking up on that. You're, you're, you're my ideal reader, Monica. <laughs> Um, the, uh, you know, I, and I, I agree with you 100%, like, you know, I, 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 it does seem like there is some way in which we are transformed by, by a second language, even if we don't necessarily feel it from day to day. I don't feel like a different person when I'm speaking Japanese. I still feel like the same, same Jeffrey that's here speaking English with you right now. Um, However, I realized that, that to the rest of the world outside, it doesn't necessarily look the same. I had a, a, a psychologist friend of mine come and visit me when I was in Japan one time. 
And um, I think she was, as a second day I was there, I got a telephone call or something. And I, and I picked up the telephone and I started speaking in Japanese. And she just, went, she pulled back physically, like, 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 and, and she said afterward, I'm, I'm like, what was that reaction about? And she said, you look like a different person. Your body language changes, you're bowing into the telephone, you know, and um, you're, you're doing things that are, that are Japanese. You don't look like the same person. I'm like, I don't. That was such a shock to me. And, um, and uh, it, made me th it made me think a lot. I mean, that was in my mind when I wrote this, that, you know, that there is this kind of apparent slippage. Um, whether or not the person themselves feels it is a different question, I think. But, but um, you know, and certainly that's something relevant to translation as well, that we're, you know, people are obsessed with the question of fidelity. Um, and even though the places where we're not being uh, faithful to a text are sometimes the most interesting, sometimes the most productive, sometimes the most creative, sometimes the most strikingly original. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of problematize that sort of idea, the idea of fidelity and realize that, you know, the translation, potentially the other voice does sometimes have its own semi quasi independence in a life outside of the, the, the original. And that's, that's what's really fascinating to me. Um, I, uh, I love the writer Yoko Tawada because she's written about that a lot, a lot. She has a German book called um, Accent Frei, um, Accent Free, which talks about like how terrible it would be if nobody spoke languages without accents. You know, how, how accents, how the inflections of other languages in, into a second language enrich massively you know, the, the language. It's a, it's a wonderful essay. I think Susan Bernofsky might've translated it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Bruno, uh, Monica? Um, yeah, that's such a tough question. I, of course, I am the same person, but I do feel different. I think because the language of my instruction was English, like all my higher education was in English. I feel smarter in English. I feel like I can speak more eloquently about stuff I care about. And then when I'm talking to my mom about feminism or something, I'm constantly grasping for language. I'm like, I don't, I didn't, I've never had this conversation in this context. Um, but there is also, I think, something, I guess I take different risks in different languages for this reason. In English, I can take syntactical risks, risks with my diction. I can be the kind of person who is like spewing out academicisms. And in Portuguese, I take risks with my sense of humor, my sense of intimacy with people. I test boundaries maybe a little more. I can be a little bit more inappropriate, more freely. Um, but yeah, like I also write about this idea that people perceive me differently in either language. And I think the fact that people perceive me differently, it, that changes me. In English, people see me as a foreigner. And that's always going to make me want to prove myself in a certain way. That's always going to want me to be, I don't know, to present myself in a certain light. And in, in Brazil, I am just a kid. I'm just me, like walking around. So it's a different kind of need that comes out of the language. And then I also write about some of the things that you've mentioned, Jeffrey, like my mother doesn't recognize me in English. And that's a particular kind of pain, a particular kind of situation. I write it about it all the time. That she's like, I, this is not the daughter I birthed. Like, who is this? What are these clothes? And yeah, I think it is, you know, so it is just a matter of being co code switching all the time. And um, when you switch audiences, you have to switch the speech, whether you like it or not. Um, well, maybe now it's actually a good time to take some questions. Such a such a skillful moderator you are, Bruna. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, just such a wonderful conversation. Um, and uh, we do have some questions, but um, since you've been talking about her, Jeffrey, this is a, as good a time as any to mention that um, we have arranged for later this in this conference, we will be speaking with Yoko Tawada and both of her translators, Margaret Mitsutani and Susan Bernofsky, as well as her editors and others who have helped to bring her to uh, English reading audiences. So we're very excited about that. Stay tuned, that will be posted on the Center for the Humanities site, but um, uh, just a little teaser first. So um, one of the first questions that came in uh, is, you've all spoken about betraying languages, canons, expectations. Have you ever felt that your language has betrayed you? Curious to hear from you. 
Monica, you want to go first? Well, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think this, this question is going that, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's about this in particular, but has, I think language betrays one sometimes when there's a lack of awareness of the history of certain terms. Uh, and as, so as playful as we wanna be, right? And as experimental as we wanna be, sometimes we also need to know what certain terms bring up in other people's minds, what histories, what, what they might be saying about certain privileges, what they might be saying about status, about class, et cetera, that it's not the language betrayed you is that you weren't aware of what you were actually saying. In other words, I, am, I do firmly believe that it is highly possible that what you think you're doing is not what the language is doing, which is exactly what happened in the review in the New York Times that Jeffrey was talking about. You know, I think the author is saying one thing, but the language is saying something completely different. Even the illustration for that review was highly problematic because it's, 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 it's China and tigers and stuff. And, and then like very abrasive language that have a history. And unfortunately, language is not just yours. You know? So, uh, or fortunately, actually, quite, yeah. It's fortunate that we can all actually use this tool to communicate with each other and, 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 and supplement all these gaps in our, in our knowledge and experience. So yeah, not sure that's where the question wanted me to go, but that's what came to mind right now. Yeah, I, 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 that's a really complicated question to answer and, 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 and a good one. Um, I often feel like uh, when I'm working in translation, some sense of betrayal, like that I'm, I'm disappointed that things don't work in English as well as I can possibly, uh, you know, as they, as they work in the original in Japanese. I do feel like sometimes my, my own language here that I'm using English has lets me down <laughs> um, often. Um, and, uh, and also part of that actually is not actually the language letting me down. Part of it is sometimes reader expectations or ed editor's expectations, you know, about how, how experimental I can be, how many Japanese language, uh, how much uh, Japanese words I can throw in. Um, to, to give one example, and I don't shamelessly self-plug, um, uh, I translated a book called The Book of the Dead, which, was, uh, which is a, a novel written by, by a, a poet. Um, and it's set in the year, um, it's set in the late 700s in, in old Japan. And it's written in a combination of, of this very experimental modernist Japanese, but with tons of classical Japanese vocabulary from 1,200 years ago thrown in. How do you, how, like that kind of like multi-layering of language, you know, within the original text, it was really difficult to figure out how to reproduce in English, where, you know, the English language has, of course, obviously the English language has a long history as well. But if I were to go back and try to find, you know, the the earliest old English equivalents of words and throw them in where the where the where the you know the text was uh, where it was in the original, it would be a completely unreadable text. You know, so like the, the things that I felt like I could do with English were so different than what I was seeing happening in the text that, that I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I struggled. This is actually the hardest thing that I've ever done, this particular translation. So yeah, so part of that has to do with like the contours um, and, and also too, how far I can push readers. Yeah, I've definitely experienced both of these. I do have another instance of struggling with my language. I've even felt angry at my language, uh, Portuguese, which is that I'm from, from a part of Brazil, the Northeast, which is it is the poorest part of the country for colonialism reasons. If you, I love being a little preach, I'm sorry, but this is my chance to push my agenda. If you read like open veins of Latin America, you will see how sugarcane plantations devastated that part of the country. And then, so now it's very poor. So the population is more uneducated, et cetera, for, because of circumstances. And it is known in Brazil as very low class. There's a lot of prejudice against that, a lot of xenophobia if you go to the metropolis like Sao Paulo in Rio if you sound like you're from the northeast there are a series of dialects that people from those places can have 
I speak like that. I don't know any other Portuguese. I mean, I've studied other Portugueses, but that's the way I speak. So whenever I meet Brazilians in the US or abroad in general, they're like, what, you talk like that? That's so funny. I've never heard anyone speak Portuguese that way. Whoa, it's real. So even with Brazilians, I suppose my compatriots, the, that kinship that I could have with language is lost. Um, I sound like I have a thick accent, which I do. And I also have an accent in English. So all my languages are a little compromised. And because it is also a colonial language, when I say I am in Portugal, um, I meet people from, you know, who speak Portuguese also. And they're like, well, your Portuguese is so good. How did you learn it? Uh, and I'm like, <laughs> you taught me. <laughs> I didn't really have much of a say. So now like that ship has sailed, uh, literally. Um, yeah, so it, it doesn't feel like I own any of my languages. None of us own any of our languages, but I do think some people get to feel like they do. Um, and I don't, I'm a little jealous, so. <laughs> Can I ask you something real quick? Just, may I? Uh, uh, and Clarissa Lis Lispector's uh, Hour of the Star, right? So yes. Maccabea. Maccabea is also from the Northeast, right? Do you recognize, is, is Clarice Lispector writing her Portuguese in a way that you understand as your own? Oh yeah, totally. No, I really, she really does. Mm -hmm. And I feel for Maccabe so much. There's a line in that book I love, which is like, oh, you know, the dreams she has, only a poor girl from the Northeast would think she could get these things. Um, she really can't. And I'm like, yes, I know Maccabe. Maccabe is my soul. Right. <laughs> I am Maccabea. Yeah. We have one more question uh, from the audience. This one comes in from Germany. Hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll ask three of you. Uh, it's about your experiences with self-translation. Um, and the question is, could self-translation be a solution to the problem of accessibility, which was discussed earlier? <clears throat> Self-translation, yeah. First of all, the, the, the fact that you've mentioned self-translation, um, uh, I, I just have to say that like, you know, I've translated a lot of people along the way. And when, when I sat down to actually translate myself for the first time, it was the most disorienting, uh, kind of upsetting experience that I've, I've ever experienced in translation. I wasn't expecting that because after all, I sort of know what the author was thinking when he wrote it, right? You know, I thought it should be super easy. However, um, uh, there, there was also, I was confronted by the fact that like, well, like I didn't, when, I, when the English came out, I didn't like it. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. I think I know the author. Maybe I can ask him to change it, you know? Like, you know, what, the, 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 the slippage between what is the original and the translation it was so great that that I didn't know where when to stop editing, and um, and that was that that's never happened before. Like with the translation, I, I kind of reach a certain point where I feel like oh I've refined it as well as I can do, you know, uh, and, and within certain boundaries. But it was like having the guardrail taken off of a of a really dangerous winding road. Like do you do you know what I mean? Like I could I could drive right off the road if I wanted to. And um, that was that was something that was very strange for me. Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, although it's certainly, I mean, one thing about self-translation, it does make the uh, the text uh, available in, in another language in a kind of a way that seems authoritative, I guess. So, since the same person did it, um, whether or not that's a good thing or not, I don't know. I have to say though that like some other people, when they translated my work into English. I love seeing it. It's fascinating to me. It's I love having the mirror kind of held up to me to 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 see to 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 show me what other people see in it. So, I, absolutely, I, I completely agree with you. That mirror that that is the most beautiful thing, right? When you go like, oh wow, it could be read this way. That's what I try to do with myself. Like have this poem and reflect it through all these different mirrors and see what I could learn about this poem. That. Uh, I thought I knew everything about because it's not a difficult poem. I chose a deliberate, deliberately very simple poem that still remains kind of mysterious to me as to how it came about or where it was going. Um, but those 25 different translations say something totally different about it. I have never translated myself into Spanish or maybe I did once one tiny little text. I'd never have done it maybe one day I would do it, but it feels like I 
already exhausted the the impetus to learn to to circle around something that I did. So I it's like it, it just feels a little too solipsistic. And one of the things I love about translation is getting into the mind of someone else. And there's just so much to learn uh, when when doing that. So I don't think I will self translate myself into Spanish. I do regret that I do not have a body of work in Spanish. That choice I made had repercussions. And so now I feel like I'm not really considered a Mexican poet, even though I am, because my body of work is primarily in English. Um, but yeah, just the other thing that always plays out here is once you begin, once you say, okay, maybe I'm gonna try this, and then you try it, and then you realize, oh, I don't need to follow the choices I made two years ago or 10 years ago when I wrote this thing. What if I take it in a different direction? And then that for me always prevails. And then that thing that began as a self-translation experiment then becomes a new work. And that's the energy that I prefer tapping into uh, from now on, kind of, yeah. Just as one very quick follow up, I mean, I love the fact that sort of the dualism of, of original and copy, you know, gets gets completely distorted in the act of self-translation. I mean, I think that actually self-translation teaches us a lot about the artificiality of those kind of, you know, power relations that exist within uh, the act of translation or, or that, or I should say the power relations that we constantly assume exist within the, um, within the uh, act of translation. Wow. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, but this has been such a wonderful conversation. And this is, this, we are going to continue a form of this conversation in the coming months. So please come back. Thank you all for your participation today. And once again, we'd like to thank our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. Thank you, and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>